Welcome, welcome, welcome uh, to the launch of Caesars by Black Market, which was a part of the amazing programming that the folks on our Black History Month committee uh, had thought up. So super excited uh, to kind of get into today's conversation. Uh, before we get too started, I do just want to go over a little bit of a land acknowledgement, and then I'll go into a little bit about what the market actually will be. Then we'll be hearing from our super dope guest speaker, uh, Jalissa from Tony Marlowe, uh, and then uh, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A if any of you folks have any questions that you want to ask. But again, before we get too into it, uh, Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. Uh, and the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Mississaugas that bound them to share that territory and protect the land. Uh, subsequent Indigenous nations and all newcomers have been welcomed into this treaty uh, in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I know it's a little bit weird to do land acknowledgements when we're in this digital time of Zoom because where I am could be totally different from where you are uh, and vice versa. Uh, so if you look in the chat, there's going to be a website posted called native-land.ca. See, I knew Maddie was gonna do it. I didn't even have to ask. I saw her typing, excellent. Uh, native-land.ca where it's super easy to check uh, whose territory you're on and sometimes also cool facts about those nations and what the languages would be. Uh, so when we talk about Toronto, uh, the word for Toronto actually comes from a Mohawk word meaning Toronto, which means uh, where the trees meet the water, which you can kind of see why that would be the name, right? And the dish with one spoon, uh, and I think it's important that after we do land acknowledgements or when we're doing land acknowledgements, we actually understand, right, the treaties and the things that we're saying. Uh, so the dish with one spoon comes from the idea that this kind of region uh, was a very naturally rich resourced area, right? Uh, it's very close to the water, which is ideal for so many different things. So a lot of different nations kind of came together in this area and shared collectively off the land, uh, which is why it's the dish, because all of those different nations were eating from the same dish, right? In that spirit of peace. And the reason it's uh, the dish with one spoon and not the dish with one fork or a knife is because I'm not sure about you folks, but when I look around my table, the spoon is definitely the least threatening, right? So it's to symbolize that coming together in the spirit of peace. Uh, so I appreciate you folks uh, hearing me out on that. I think it's important that we start our spaces with that. Uh, and if any of you folks would want to learn more, uh, feel free to check out that native-land.ca uh, page for any information that you might want as a good starting piece. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what the buy block market is actually going to look like because I know right now it's probably a little bit confusing you're like this is a Facebook live or this is a zoom event, how is this a market right. So Caesar actually launched a Facebook group which you can find on our Facebook page called Caesars buy block market, uh, where we are inviting various black owned businesses. Uh, to post things that they would like to have for sale for folks uh, in the Caesar community or the Ryerson community. We are incentivizing Black businesses to post things. So if you are a Black business owner uh, or interested in posting some of your creations, we will pay you to post your things for sale. Uh, so please do. Uh, we are looking to have that page populated. If you're a student who makes art, maybe if you're someone who's never even sold anything before, or if you are a Black creator, period, we want you to have a platform to sell your works. So please check out that page. Uh, and the reason we're kind of doing this event today, uh, yes, absolutely can drink, uh, drop the link to the marketplace. Uh, and the reason why we're kind of doing this today is just to kind of raise awareness, hey, this group is drop, uh, dropped and kind of talk about why it actually is so important to have spaces uh, like this carved out when it comes to keeping the dollar in the black community uh, and creating businesses and services that aren't just modeled and catered to whiteness. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to drop this. And because, you know, we're all students, we're all trying to make some coins, people should have opportunities to share their stuff where they can, right? Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Jalissa uh, to introduce themselves a little bit uh, and talk about um, Tony Marlowe. Okay, so hi everyone, thank you, Zaid. Um, always happy to be here, as I said, uh, you know, former Ryerson uh, graduate, and just all around, I've always just appreciated, uh, you know, Ryerson and, and students who actually 
do things. <laughs> While I was in school, I, I was not as proactive and involved as I would have liked to have been. Um, as I had said, my name is Julissa Lucas Mendez. I'm the founder of Tony Marlowe Clothing. We make undergarments for people who redefine gender norms. So our core products are period boxers and packer boxers for women, trans men, and non-binary people who were assigned female at birth. And we donate one dollar of every product sold to suicide prevention. Um, I just want to say like this is a really great initiative that you guys are doing. Um, as many opportunities as possible for um, you know marginalized or I hate that word marginalized, but uh, oppressed and and underrepresented folks to have an opportunity to actually get their work out there and and have that chance is always great and and I support it. So thank you guys for you know putting this together and that's really cool that you're even paying to have businesses post. Um, I just that, that's just awesome <laughs> because you know you can post on a lot of different places and promote your business but it doesn't always immediately lead to sales so I think that's a really really kind and uh, great thing that you're doing to help incentivize and also give a little bit of uh, you know a kickback for people putting themselves out there um, so yeah I was just gonna talk about you know I'm pretty casual please feel free to ask questions along the way um, but generally, and I will need a verbal cue that there's a question. I'm not actually that able to uh, read the, the sidebar too much and, and engage as well. But um, you know, overall, we're just going to talk about Black entrepreneurship and how that relates to Black liberation. And you know, when I was talking with Zayed at first, I was just kind of like, to me, it's so simple. You know, it's obvious, like money rules the world that we live in. Unfortunately, that's how it is. And um, as although money doesn't buy happiness, that's the saying, but the reality is money does buy happiness to a certain dollar amount, right? And when you're living below a certain um, level of, of disposable income, like actual income you can use, uh, you're not happy. Poverty is not fun. <laughs> you, might, you might invent a lot of things, it might be creative, you might get close with people, uh, but it's not fun and it, it's not a good way to live and it's no one's choice ever, really and truly. Um, it's very rare and when it is it's it's generally not by oppressed folks right no one really chooses to to suffer um anyways that's a whole other rant that i can go on but we're not going to go there <laughs> but the point is that black entrepreneurship is one of the main ways in my personal view for black liberation and truly uh, I would just say uh, overall liberation for people of color because as you look around you see black people always lead the way we're always doing the work and we always carry the the brunt of, of everyone else and have the, the least privileges although our indigenous folks we're not playing oppression olympics but us two are, are on the bottom right and if black folks have economic mobility and freedom and independence, um, I personally believe economies and the world as a whole can be a much healthier, happier, uh, better place. And income is the root of a lot of troubles in our world. And you see that with capitalism as a whole, it doesn't matter what race you are, right? So when people have what they need, which at this point in time is provided by dollars, you have a lot less problems. So that's my general thing there. So specifically on black entrepreneurship, right? Um, I mean, it's just exciting. We've all been hustling, you know, we have this term a hustler, hustler, always getting money, chase the bag, this and that, like, but the fact is we've always been doing it. And now given the times in terms of the internet and social awareness, we have way more resources and um, allies and support and just the actual ability to put our businesses, put our side hustles out there into full on big businesses, small businesses, whatever you wanna call it, but it's no longer something that you just do on the side for fun or you just do because you have to. You People are now in a position um, where you can become very serious about it and make a living off of it, make a whole career. And so that's a really, it's just a really beautiful time, really exciting um, place to be. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the general gist. And like, feel free, anyone that's here, feel free to jump in and just kind of ask more specific questions or even challenge me if you want. Um, and again, like, as I said, I talked on a lot of broad things, but if you wanna 
narrow it down and kind of dive deeper on any of any of the topics I just mentioned, please feel free to because we're here to learn and I know I, I trust that most people who are going to watch this kind of already understand how economics work and that <laughs> if you give uh, under underrepresented and marginalized oppressed people the ability to provide for themselves, it's going to lead to positive outcomes all in all. I think that's pretty common sense for, for the most part for people with, you know, a little bit of common sense and a little bit of decency. So please feel free to uh, jump in here. I like the part that you mentioned about like kind of the importance of like keeping the dollar like also within the community. Uh, and I think that's been a really interesting concept that I've been reading about recently where it's like oftentimes for so many like racialized or otherwise marginalized communities, I also hate that word. Uh, when we kind of have those conversations, it's yeah, like you're making money, but the that dollar is actually only staying in your community sometimes for hours or minutes, right? Because when you're paying into services, there are services owned by white colonial governments or white uh, white folks with colonial interests and racist interests so much of the time. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit about like one of the reasons, like how it's so important to kind of keep that dollar in community uh, and maybe uh, kind of I, what you were mentioning previously about like poverty is no one's choice and kind of keeping that dollar can help that. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And please, if you have a better memory than I do, bring that up again in terms of, you know, the white anarchist to be houseless for edginess. Um, just bring that back up. I have a, a good little story time on that. But yeah, in terms of keeping the black dollar in the black community, like that's, it's crucial, right? Because as you said, if, if we make our own businesses and, and people are buying from us, but then that profit that we make is immediately spent somewhere else, how long are we gonna be at this? You know what I mean? Like how, how much more, how much longer is it gonna take us to get out of this place, right? And in other communities, other racialized communities, like it circulates for some, some communities, I don't remember the exact stats, so I'm not gonna put numbers out there, but I know in like, um, you know, Asian communities, and I say that as a blanket statement, I understand there are various groups, but Asian communities, it's, I think it's like weeks before that single dollar could leave to, you know, like you said, colonial capitalist racist uh, institutions and, and businesses. So meanwhile, in the black community, it is actually, I did see a stat and it was ours. I don't remember how many hours, but it was ours. And like, that really hurts me, that's sad, right? And it's like, we're brilliant, we're resourceful, we have the ability to do so much and we're doing so much, that's the thing. We're doing so much. Um, and so it comes right back down to that. If we keep the money within our community, it's like interest. If you keep your, your money in a bank that gives you 1% interest, so we'll call that the one day it takes to get out of the, the Black community, versus uh, another bank that allows you to, to make, you know, 5% interest. Well, how much more money are you going to make in each bank, right? And once you make more money, then what can you do? You can invest in other things, you can help other people out, you can enjoy your life, and money is also meant to be enjoyed, right? So that's how it all ties back in, is that not only do we need the opportunities to create the businesses, we need the opportunities for them to be seen and also to be um, redispersed within, right? And one thing I would say, like, and this might be controversial or, or not, I'm not sure, some people feel differently, but, you know, there is a, um, a point of view of, oh, it should only be buy Black and we don't want white dollars. And I always think that's so wild. Like, no, I want the white dollars too, because <laughs> right now they're still the majority overall, right? In terms of a single race, race is a construct, but you know what I mean? Like, we, so we need everyone to participate. Um, but once we get income, we shouldn't just run to the mall and buy mainstream things, right? And I, this goes beyond just black uh, economics, right? Like, if you can't buy black, then buy from woman led buy from a queer business, buy indigenous, buy local, buy from someone who's, you know, differently abled. I'm not sure what the, the most accurate PC term is right now. But, you know, I mean, we don't have to only buy from corporations and support, you know, cishet white males and, and corporations that like, who does that even belong to? You know what I mean? So there's always a, another option. Um, and so on that note, I'm going to give a shameless plug. Um, I started a new business and we're in the process of doing a soft launch, hopefully this month, um, if not very soon, so stay tuned, but it's called Noir Now, and it's created to address this problem exactly. There are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of Black-owned businesses, 
and we have consistent allies and then we have waves of new allies or bandwagoners who want to come on and oh yeah buy black show i'm not racist right and obviously as time goes on the the number of people who are genuine allies will continue to grow but how do we help support our own like i said how do we keep our own dollars within our community as well as allow those outside of the the black community who want to support us how do we let them do that if they don't even know where to find our businesses because a lot of us are starting with little to nothing so not everyone has amazing websites or knows how to do uh, seo to invest in it or spend money on ads so most people are relying on word of mouth going on social media and searching for hashtags and people have to remember to put in black owned when they google right so noir now that's the company we our first product is called shop black first and what it is is a google extension that allows you to immediately find the black owned alternatives for whatever it is you're searching for. So if you literally are just in any Google bar, what's something, what's the last thing one of you bought? That you can say. <laughs> uh, paper towels. Paper towels. There is a, a black owned paper towel company in the States. Um, so if you are on Google and you're like paper towels, you're out of them, you want to buy them instead of seeing, you know, Bounty or whatever the other ones are, obviously that's the brand I use clearly, or like PC no name, a little, our icon will glow. And if you click it, uh, a list of black owned paper towel companies will open up. And if it's not paper towel companies, it'll be a black owned corner store that has paper towel. So just to reiterate, uh, it's uh, the app is called Shop Black First. The company is called Noir Now. All you're doing is you're downloading a Google Chrome extension. And anytime you search anything, if there is a black option for it, the icon will glow, you click it, and a list of black owned businesses will drop down that specifically have the product that you were just searching for. And if you're on a website and it's black owned, it'll glow um, gold. So even if you don't know, because a lot of people, until recently, you know, it wasn't always a positive marketing idea to, to, to announce that you're black owned, right? A lot of one of our main tools was always assimilation, right? And blending in. So a lot of businesses were black owned and you wouldn't even know like Calendy all this time, I had no idea it was black owned. I just thought if I was a company, you know, tech, probably another white guy. No, it's a black man who, who founded it, right? So if you want to be a little more discreet, you also have that option. Um, so you can just you know, be shopping and then just get that encouragement to be like, actually, yeah, let's choose this company. I see that 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 gold uh, icon. Let's let's put our dollars there. Anyways, that is my my rant and my shameless plug. But I think it's important, and I, I think that's also for me to show you how important I think black economics and black entrepreneurship truly is. Um, I see little notifications, so I'll just if there are questions, if someone could just like read them out because I can. Yeah, that I can just keep going. Um, no, that's like that idea is amazing. Like that's super, 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 super cool. Absolutely plug that. Uh, and I'm super excited to check that out. And I think that like tools like that are oftentimes like you were saying, like so helpful because oftentimes the onus is kind of put on racialized or marginalized people to add like advertise themselves in that way or on marginalized people to try to find all of those extra things where like you shouldn't have to do extra resources, like extra research and spend extra time when you're already probably suffering burnout from racism to try yeah. to find resources to keep the dollar in your own community. So that's super, super dope. And if folks are like maybe new with this kind of concept, there's a really accessible and cool documentary on Netflix by Killer Mike from Run the Jewels actually. And he does an episode on buying black and keeping the dollar in the black community where he does like a full 20 24 hour uh, or 48 hour experiment where he exclusively buys black. Buys black. Awesome. Yeah, and it shows like a really cool, like it really points out the disparities and what that actually looks like. Uh, like there's a scene where he goes to a black grocery store, for example, to buy beans from a farm, but like he can't open it because there's not a black owned can opener company, <laughs> things like that. So it's like wow, it really yeah. breaks down and makes you realize how prevalent like colonial and white capitalism is. Yeah. Uh, which kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, oftentimes, especially uh, we know in queer spaces and in the queer business sector and queer party sector, really every asset of queerness on these lands, despite uh, heterosexuality being a colonial concept, we know that white queerness is always the center 
of queer narratives on these lands and creating queer services and businesses that are kind of holistic of racialized queers and not only inclusive of racialized queer and trans people, but actively seeking to support queer and trans people is really, really unique and hard to find in our communities. Uh, how has it been running a queer centered business as a racialized individual? It's a really good question. It's a common question. And I'm thankfully getting to a place where I can more clearly, you know, reflect on it. Um, previously, I was just so focused on whatever it is I'm trying to do. And I, you know, anyone who knows me knows I just, I'm really, really genuine and sweet and good hearted. <laughs> and I make that face when I say, cause it like, it makes me sick. Like it's a good quality, but it's a little annoying. And so for a lot of my life, I just, because we're in Canada, so much of racism is covert. And because I'm not, because I'm, I'm what multi-intersectional, marginalized, whatever, right? I'm black, I'm assigned female at birth, I'm queer. You know what I mean? There's so many reasons why someone may have a negative, you know, reaction to me, response to me. Um, so whenever those things happened, I honestly, unless it was very obvious that it was race, I wouldn't go to the race card and I wouldn't see it that way. Now upon, you know, a few years, several years in now and having this question come up enough and, and starting to kind of look around and be like, you know what? Tony Marlowe was the first, um, the first um, queer focused for the, for the, for people assigned female at birth. There was lots of gay brands, but there was the first um, AFAB underwear brand in Canada. And we were the first one to do the period underwear in the way that we did, that we do it. Um, which is with that layer that lifts up so they can put a pad with wings in it. And so when I started this, you know, in 2015, there was literally no one else that I could find on the internet in Canada. And there was less than 10 that I could find, you know, in the States. And I think I seen one in Australia, one or two in the UK. Um, if you look now, it's like possibly well over 100. 200 like there's so many obviously not all of them are going to be large but there's so many but there's also at least maybe 10 to 20 that are large like making bank and you know one of my it was actually my business partner told me the other day and he was just like look how many there are now tony marlowe is part of what started that 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 progression right but in the same vein I do look at it and I look at say the top five and I'm like, they're so much bigger in terms of dollars or brand awareness. And, you know, everyone has their, you know, you know, their unique selling value, but as an overall, I'm going to stand by my brand. I still think we're the best or one of the best, right? Amongst the top three, at least why sometimes I get frustrated like why are we not at that same financial level and you know I try to I've tried to deny and I try not to think about it but at the end of the day I look at it I'm like all of the ones that are financially successful to the degree that I you know I'm aspiring to they all have a, a white person involved even the ones that are you know there's a even when there's partners where it's a black one one person is black and one person's white like so still power to them there's still that white partner or there's that cis person, or there's that, you know, that man, that cis man that's involved in some way. Um, and so I would say my experience as a black queer business owner, running a queer centered business, all in all, because I'm Canadian and I just choose not to focus on the negative, hasn't been hurtful or negative in that way. I haven't faced any overt harsh racism or homophobia in, in that way. But economically, um, and just kind of mentally, it's like, damn, like, honestly, had I just had it has been white, probably be a lot further, <laughs> be a lot further. Um, and that shows up in the sense of getting more grants, getting investors, winning more competitions, getting more free services, shout outs, um, and things like that. And this isn't to say I'm not, we haven't had that support because we would not be anywhere near where we are without the incredible support from community. All those things I just mentioned, we get. We've won 
you know, events, pitches, grants. And we've had so many people just offer their time and be like, let me help you with my services. I believe in what you're doing. And so we're forever grateful. But the point is like, if we were white, that the amount of that would be higher. And so we would have been further faster. And I think that's basically, you know, how I can say my negative experience has been in terms of, you know, being black and queer running a business. Um, on the other hand, like I said, we have, we are successful and we've gone somewhere. We do have a ton of support. So in the same breath, it's also been very positive. A lot of our supporters are, are white folks, queer and straight, cis and, and trans and, and non-binary of all kinds um, who just see the vision, get it, and they, they get the product and they fall in love and they're like, we want to stand behind you. And then there's those super allies who are just like, we especially want to get behind you because you are Black and queer and, you know, this is our allyship. How can we amplify amplify your voice and, and help get your brand out there further? And, you know, so deeply, you know, appreciative of those folks as well. Um, that's that's my that's that. <laughs> that uh, no, and like I think that totally makes sense because I think that as, like as someone who's tried several of these brands, also like in terms of quality, like I, I agree that like Tony Marlowe is definitely at the top, where like white owned businesses that have lesser quality, and you can tell that less was kind of invested into those products sometimes get more credit. And I think it also has to do with some of the ways in which we've like coded transness to look like, right? Mm -hmm. Where we've like coded AFAB folks, whether they be non-binary or trans masks to be like fairly androgynous or like hyper-masculine white muscular dudes, right? Yeah. Like Aiden Dowling or like yeah. um, Buck Angel and like folks like that. So like, I yeah. think that, yeah, I thought that like was a super important and like pertinent part that you talked about. Yeah. Um, sure. I had something and it just slipped me, but it'll it'll come back. Okay, if it comes back, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we need. I did. You wanted me to bring you back to the, and we can go into this rant now, or we can go into this rant after. But when Jalissa had mentioned earlier the comments uh, about about white anarchists and choosing houselessness, yes. that was just something that I had messaged them privately. But essentially, the idea when oftentimes when we talk about celebrating racialized businesses or black businesses or indigenous owned businesses or queer owned businesses, whatever it may be. Um, white leftist folks that sometimes said to be like, okay, but capitalism is bad in all of its senses. And I, in no way, I don't think any of us disagree with that, but I think for racialized communities that have been actively disenfranchised and put into positions because of poverty, uh, wanting to seek out that capital is not necessarily in the interest of upholding capitalism, but is in essence a part of that freedom and a part of kind of moving forward. Uh, so when Jalissa had made a comment about folks who experience like houselessness, uh, not by choice, where there's this concept that like a lot of white anarchists, for example, will choose to be houseless, even though their white families are rolling in cash and use resources from racialized folks and from other houseless folks who are put into that situation because of these systemic forces in the yeah. first place. So disgusting. <laughs> Sorry, but it just it's it's so disgusting. But thank you so much for one, the reminder and two, such a great breakdown. Um, so yes, gather around folks, story time. Um, but no, so in short, I was in a, a really great program, business program called BizStart. It's here in Toronto. Uh, if you're under 29, 18 to 29, you can enroll and it's full time for about six months and they will pay you a uh, minimum wage for I think like 30 or 40 hours a week. So basically you get a full time minimum wage uh, check to learn and implement business. So you get about three months of daily hands-on training to get ready to launch your business. And then you get three months where you have a mentor and like two, like one or two days a week, you go in uh, for more, you know, workshops and mentoring and things like that, but you're actively working on your business and you're still getting paid. So it's an incredible program. Um, and so I did that a couple, a few years ago. And one of the mentors came in, I still, you know, I really like him and I still like him, even though he definitely, you know, had a grave oversight. But so he's this cis het white guy. Well, I can't say he's he's het, I don't know. But this cis white man comes in and is talking about business and he has great information. And then he's like going on about how, you know, he he's homeless. And I don't wanna I don't wanna say that that was verbatim, but in essence, he basically is is promoting the fact with a big smile that he's homeless. 
right? And that he makes, made a choice to just focus on his business and work the system and make a really great product that allows him to sell online and then go live in Thailand and like not have like, don't have rent. And like, he just put his stuff in storage. And, and I was just like, man, like, so again, as I said, in terms of the way that I am, yeah, I realized that was a messed up comment. But for me, I didn't stay dwelling on that. I was like, he's still giving so much other knowledge. <laughs> I was just like, give me all the knowledge I was taking in. But most of the people in the class were pissed, right? And rightfully so, right? They were offended. And, and so it was a whole thing. And I don't think he was welcomed back, which makes sense, right? But for someone to choose, someone with the privilege of having the option to choose to put their things in storage and go live in Thailand, that is not what being homeless or houseless is. That's called a digital nomad. <laughs> like, you're right, you're a successful business person and you can run your business literally from the beach. It's been everyone's dream since the dawning of the internet and now you get to live it. But like, don't rub that in people's faces. Just teach us how to do that. And don't say that like, you know, you don't have a home or whatever. It's like, no, you're choosing not to. You have belongings that need to go in storage that you can pay to put in storage and then buy a plane ticket and then go live in this beautiful place. And yes, you're, you know, you're benefiting from leveraging the dollar difference, right? So like, it sounds luxurious, but really and truly, maybe your income isn't so incredible. You're single and, you know, so you don't have children and a spouse to take care of. So that definitely limits things. So maybe, yeah, you know, he, he's, he's promoting this, this life that's, you know, millions of dollars, but it's like, no, it's not. It's something that's achievable. He didn't focus on that. He just focused on, oh yeah, I'm homeless. And, you know, you can do that too, make a cool brand and, and then you can travel to wherever. And it's just like, what? So yeah. I think people, you know, it's like, so just, Having, a, having an awareness of, of your use of language and the tone and your audience and like trying to find the best words to respectfully describe what you're talking about. And if you don't at least say upfront, as I said, like, I'm like, I don't know what the most politically correct and, and you know, compassionate word is for differently abled people right now. Cause I've seen some places online saying that going back to disabled is, is correct. I'm not too sure, but like making that clear, hopefully, is not going to offend anyone and I will be able to Google it and then confirm with someone I trust that, yeah, this is the right thing, right? Anyway, so that was my story time. It just, it blew my mind that he just like felt no way about it. And we love story time. <laughs> Thank you for that. No, and I agree. Like, I think like if the intention is always there, right, to cause the, le the least harm that we can, then that should be in the intentions that we bring. Um, and I think like going back to that point too, just about that specific example about this man who did that, like so many communities also in countries like Thailand and Bali, for example, are saying that like these white people are coming and taking up affordable homes and affordable housing for us, which is increasing our cost of living by bringing again, kind of, it's literally like a neo-colonialism yep. uh, of a lot of these places. So it's also like, sir, you go to like, Thailand and colonizing aspects of Thailand to be affordable for you isn't a win and isn't something people should be doing. Um, but yeah, and I think that like having those conversations and like talking about these things are so important and kind of unpacking some of the ways in which we think about capital and some of the ways we think about some of these other aspects. I think it becomes really easy for white folks and folks with outlived experiences of houselessness and poverty, for example, to say like, oh, so we're just going to support a new form of capitalism or like, oh, so we're just going to do this. Shouldn't we be moving away? And it's like, yeah, we absolutely should be moving away. But in the meantime, we can't ignore the fact that various communities are vastly struggling because of the very systems that are put into place, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's not that it's like pro-capitalism, it's agreeing with all the criticisms of capitalism being a colonial Western concept that is rooted directly in benefiting uh, a European and colonial and white uh, business model. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think like I, that was just something I, I wanted and I'm happy we got to theory brain a lot about because mm -hmm. I think it's important that like white leftists and folks who are trying to be allies and other racialized folks too are kind of reflecting on that as an aspect when we have these conversations about uh, black entrepreneurship or marginalized entrepreneurship and what that actually looks like. Sure. Um, and it's exactly what you're saying, right? Like nothing, it, it, we're on the road to something different. But mm -hmm. while we're still walking this road, like let's you be better while we're on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I think just to like finish us off, okay, I think like, this is my last question. Um, and then we can maybe go to questions if anyone else has any, but 
I think, can you, uh, if you have any words of wisdom for like aspiring black youth who want to start their own businesses, um, like what are things that you wish you had been told? Um, or even just like, you know, a hype up session. I'm never a good hype up person, not my skills, but you know, maybe it's one of yours. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, advice to any entrepreneurs, but specifically black entrepreneurs, it's pretty much the same thing. Just do it. And you know what I mean? Start somewhere. And what, what have we always done? We do what we can with what we have where we're at. That's, that's part of our survival and our resilience. Uh, dig it up. It's in your blood. It's in your DNA. And your ancestors did not go through what they went through for you to not at least try. Definitely rest. I seen a quote the other day, yesterday, it was like a reminder, like, you know, our ancestors were literally, literally dying for just one day of rest. So we overwork ourselves a lot. Um, so also give yourself rest. But for those who haven't started yet, it's more that push of like, you got to start. And that could mean, and a lot of people get overthink and I have a lot of anxiety and I used to be this way and I still am to a degree as Zay knows I called him earlier I was like I don't know if I'm ready <laughs> um, but just start so that could just mean like google whatever it is you want to do see who else is out there and start making a list of what they do well and what they don't do so well and then that will lead your mind to something else like okay so they're they don't do this so well maybe I can do it better how can I do it better do I have the resources I don't what would I need to be able to do that part better, right? And you'll just start getting ideas, but nothing's gonna come to you. Your intuition is not gonna kick in and your curiosity is gonna be your biggest guide. It's not gonna kick in if you don't at least start. And so starting again is, you know, send that text to the friend being like, hey, what is, you know, um, what do you think about this? Google something, follow a page, um, or even like just make something, make something with your hands. It could be made from paper mache, like just try to do something. Um, being scared is normal, being excited is normal. Um, one of the bittersweet things about being a, you know, oppressed group is right now people are aware and trying to do better, trying to do better. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, so there's a lot of, um, programming and, and funding for Black youth to start businesses, start nonprofits, to do things. So what I always tell people is just go into Google and type in all your, you know, your otherness and just put Black grants, female grants, women grants, queer grants, trans grants, whatever it is. And if it's not grants you're looking for, if it's mentorship, whatever it is, but just the thing you need and the labels this system puts on you, put them together and put your, your city your, your, and then your province and then your country and you'll get different results. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my general thing. Yeah, I think that was great. And like, I, I think two things just to like comment on back at that, like I think the idea like oftentimes as racialized people were like constantly tokenized. So the idea of tokenizing ourselves feels weird. But yep. absolutely, like tokenize yourself to get those coins, like tokenize yourself to get the colonizer money. Thank do what you. you need to do. They're going to tokenize you anyway. You it might as well benefit. Your benefit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Self-select and benefit. Yeah. Like if yeah. you're not going to get it, someone else is going to get it, you know? Exactly. So like it's sometimes it's okay to work things to our advantage in a society where it's telling us that those things are inherently negative. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's exactly the thing, right? It's you know, what is it? T get a taste of their own medicine, right? Use their system and their tactics against them. This is the system they built. Give me your money. These are the rules they provided. You want us to be good little folk? All right, I'm, I'm following your rules. Yeah. <laughs> give me my money. Give me my. <laughs> yeah. I, Help us out. I, yeah. That, thank uh, you so much. Um, I know you. I know we got to get going. So I just wanted to say thank you so much before I keep talking. Um, it's it's been a great it's been a great chat. Thanks. I appreciate it. I've also had a great time and we really appreciate you coming out too. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on that was important, I think about that last thing that you said was also like, yeah, the importance to give yourselves like permit and ability to take a break. And I think again, like as racialized people, it's sometimes really tricky because you know that you have to run five times faster just to catch up to the white dude who's walking. Just to catch up, not even Yeah, fast. because he has an easier path, right? Or because they have an easier path. So like, it feels like any amount of sleep 
can like set back that progress when you know you have to work extra hard. But also if you're burnt out, you're not going to be coming to the table with your best ideas anyway. So I really appreciate that reminder for so many folks. And I think it's so important that like taking those breaks may feel like it's hindering you, but like taking those breaks is what's going to make you great, right? And like, it's okay to be black and to be indigenous and to be racialized and take a break when the whole world is telling you constantly that you don't deserve one right mm -hmm. so i think like that's a radical act in and of itself mm -hmm. um but thank you so much for coming we absolutely loved having you and this conversation was super rad um for any folks who want to catch it or if you wanted to send it to anyone anyone who is here wanted to pass it along it is going to stay up on the facebook page uh so folks can share that live and kind of share this conversation with folks if you know someone who is a black creator or a black business owner uh, tell them to reach out to us or give me the contact and I'll reach out to them uh, so we can get their contact up on the page and get them their coins for posting on the page. Um, but otherwise, uh, this has been great in my humble opinion. Uh, and thanks so much again for plugging Mar now uh, at the bottom there. I'm probably just going to reach out to all of the places that I see on there. Uh, so thank you so much for that as well. Awesome. Thank you guys all for having me. It's been great. And um, my line's always open, so feel free to reach out to me on social media if you want. So, and then last note is that we do have our last uh, Black History Month programming event this week. Let me just pull up and double check the times really quick. Yeah, on Friday, we are going to be having a panel called The Need for Caribbean History uh, with a guest speaker. Uh, who is a PhD candidate in Caribbean studies from York University to talk about why Caribbean history is an important component to Black history uh, and about why learning Caribbean history is, is crucial in the fight for Black liberation uh, and centering Caribbean narratives. Uh, so please come out to that event as well. But thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your Wednesday.